Good morning, Garden America Nation. Thank you for being right there. A lot of people tuned in already as we uh, kick off your weekend. Happy Saturday morning. We're about six minutes after the hour. There we go. I cut that off. First time that's happened in about a month where my laptop is feeding back. I don't think you can hear it through over the radio or on uh, Facebook Live, but we can certainly hear it. So we say good morning once again. It is uh, seven minutes after the hour now. Tiger, John, I'm Brian Maine. Welcome to your weekend. A lot happening today. Great guests lined up, and we do trust that you've had a good week. And you'll be involved today with questions and comments. You know, the today's topic is kind of an interesting thing for a garden show, right? You know, rebugging the planet. Oh, you know, normally we're just talking about how to eliminate bugs. We're going to rebug it today, yeah, right? Yeah, and now we're talking about let's bring them back. Just weird, weird topic, right? It is a weird topic <laughs> when you think about it because no one ever thinks about You think about different uh, species disappearing, right? Mm -hmm. Possible extinctions with certain uh, things that are bigger than bugs that you can see if they're gone. Right, but bugs, that, that's difficult. Yeah, and... Usually, you just like Tiger says, you put bugs into one category, right? Yeah. Now let me. Just, let me you want to get rid of them. Here's what I surmise, because you talked about well, when something big disappears, it's obvious. Yeah. But when bugs disappear, it's a little less obvious, or even even a lot more obvious. I would say that, and again, I don't know this to be a fact, but I would say your first uh, clue would be changes in the environment. Mm -hmm. Something along the line is not happening that used to happen. Yeah. Let's look into it further. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, well, that that bug is no longer here. Yeah. And the, that makes sense. Yeah. And the guest that we're talking in, um, with today, Vicki, who wrote the book, Rebugging the Environment, will talk about how there's uh, there's like three basic things that are kind of like, you know, like you're saying, changing the environment. Right. You know, different <clears throat> different styles of pollution. Um, and then, you know, um, I forget what the other one was. Should she I have said, said ecological balance? Yeah. You know, but it is a balance. And then, you know, bugs, because they're smaller, they're more susceptible to a negative effect on the changes. Meaning, like, you know, when, when it's smoky air outside and whatnot, we don't feel good and we breathe it in. And, you know, that's not great for us. But at the end of the day, we'll probably be okay. Well, for a small right. thing, that could ultimately, you know, cause them to die. And, you know, that's very difficult to manage. So, John, right? is this what entomologist uh, study is this what the Ent whole entomologist yeah. entomology thing here study insects right 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 now you're bugged a lot but that's different <laughs> <laughs> sometimes by things that aren't that far away from me <laughs> <laughs> isn't he good yeah now we should mention john got up early this morning took a shower and and tiger and i were wondering because he took an extra what 20 minutes in the green room this morning getting ready <laughs> and uh which is why he's in tip-top shape. He's got the nice tan going. Now, yep. the makeup, the foundation of his makeup is perfect. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little rough, but i got to give it to John this morning. He's looking good, feeling good. Yeah. Tan rested and ready, as we say. You know, you were just mentioning bugs, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, um, you know, and I'm sure Vicki will be talking about this, but there is a chain that starts with you know the microscopic and works its way up and there's some certain plant species that can go extinct because their pollinator becomes That's extinct true. so there's a yeah. chain reaction here right yeah. you lose a bug you lose this it's the domino effect and and that's why this is so vital. Well, and if that plant goes extinct, what used to feed on that plant could possibly go extinct and then pretty soon it reaches us yep exactly. it may take a while. I mean, but it's possible. Anybody that watched The Lion King should know this. It's the circle of life, right? You know, we're all connected. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's going to be interesting today. And she's calling in from England, Great Britain. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so. we're, we're, we're crossing the pond. It's going to be 4, 4 p.m. when she's calling right, us. Right. Eight hour when, difference, when I think. 8 a.m. here. Yeah. Right. Now, John, you've got the quote of the week. I do. And it's by, oh, gosh. Because he also, I think he wrote, well, go ahead and give me his name because I want to make sure I've got this straight. I think he wrote the Paul Revere poem. That was Longfellow that wrote Paul Henry Revere. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow? Yeah. Okay, so so he's not the quote of the week, right? Correct. Okay. <laughs> At least John knew. And you yeah. know what? What I learned, Paul Revere never said that British are coming, that British are coming. See, I don't Red, believe Red that. Coast. He said the regulars are coming. The right. regulars are coming. Because everybody was British, even right. if you were in this country. You were still British, but you weren't part of the separatist movement. Mm -hmm. 
Very interesting. So you were thinking of Henry David Thoreau. Thank That's you. who the quote is See? from. I don't know. Kick it to John. He'll set me straight. <laughs> nice. And it uh, kind of pertains to our topic today, right? Yep. Absolutely, Doug. You and do a good job of that. He said, nature will bear the closest inspection. She invites us to lay our eye level with her smallest leaf and take an insect view of its plane. Of its plane? <laughs> Is that right? Did he say that? He did. And how is it spelled, plane? <laughs> I, I think I was uh, surprised because I thought plan for a second. Yeah. yeah. But it's P-L-A-I-N. So we are going to be talking about insects or lack of. Yeah. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago about the our, our cars don't have Bug smashed parts. insects on the windshields or little legs or wings in the grill anymore as yeah. we used to have. And And I got a question for the listeners because we live in San Diego County and I would say for the most part, you know, uh, where we drive, except for John, is going to go through a lot more of city areas. You know, but even John along the highways, they're big highways. Like, you know, the 15 is a big highway. Right. right. You know, I wonder if people that live in rural areas that have the small two-lane roads still have a lot of you, you bugs mean, the on further, their windshields. The further away from you get from the city. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah. If well, if we have any listeners in Florida, they're probably thinking... <laughs> What are you talking about? There's no more bugs. I was well, you, they actually have spider crossings in Florida. They're that big. <laughs> like, a, you know, you see a deer sign, you know, yeah. big spider crossing. I was talking to Florida because um, I wanted to get someone from Top Tropicals on, uh -huh. you know, soon. And, yeah, I've been reading The uh, Orchid Thief. So oh, I have yeah. this thing we're working on. But um, what was it that they were, yeah, they, they were talking about how, you know, over there it's just the 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 land overtakes everything yeah, yeah yeah and bugs and plants and you know if you didn't know you were in florida you could be in the amazon or <laughs> yes, some jungle yes. nation because you're right there's that much tropical influence and, there in and, and then like crazy creatures too you know oh, not just yeah. not just alligators like well, other things way, that are bugs are so big you can see their facial expressions <laughs> they're huge when, you, when you're in florida you feel I don't know if oppressed is the right word, but <laughs> it's a good. The weather, it's heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. It is heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, when you come back home to California and get off that plane, it's like, wow, I can breathe. There's <laughs> nothing pressing in on me. Yeah. No, I, I was there several years ago and felt the same way. It's like, get off my back. <laughs> looking around, but yeah, it's the heavy humidity. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty far south. Good yeah. for plants. Oh, they excellent. They have a lot of nurseries there, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, my hey, my hibiscus lately, I come home and there's a new one blooming every day. Yeah. In fact, for the first time last week, Dana said, hey, nice hibiscus. I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> should I just stop there? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We'll just stop right there. How many, right. how many flowers does yours have on it right now? Do Four. You know? Four? Four. Yeah. I think, I'm, I think I'm watering mine too much. I have one, and it's only got one flower, but it's Beautiful green, lush. Yeah, but you get foliage. Do you have good drainage. That shouldn't be a yeah, problem. No, I have good drainage, but I think I'm just watering it too much. I'm watering mine about maybe this is too much. Three days a week. Well, yours are in pots, right? Yeah. Mine's in the ground. Oh, it's a whole yeah. different thing. Yeah. What kind of soil do you have? Um, mostly sandy loam. Yeah, well, that should. It's not too hard no. of stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and every once in a while I run into heavy clay and whatnot, but. You know, not 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 where the hibiscus is. Well, I've got two, and and one is not blooming as well as the other, and they're the same. They're both the same species, the same hibiscus. Yeah. Hey, Rick in Star Idaho moved into his new house. Hey, hey, hey Rick, Rick. way to go, buddy. Maybe Rick. that's why we didn't hear from Rick last weekend. Yeah. Yeah, could be. We moved into our new house what three months ago now. Right. And the garage is still full is of it? boxes. Is it? Yeah. You know what? Moving is the worst. I yeah. just dread that because yeah. we have a storage unit as well. But, yeah. but you have so much room to put stuff, right? So it's not, like, difficult. You're just trying to figure out. You're just taking the time to do it because you have a place for everything. Right? And you're probably going to get rid of stuff too, right? You already did get rid of I, stuff. I don't moved. like getting rid of stuff, but we are. Really? Yeah. I, I would have guessed the opposite. Really? About you. Yeah. Because I'm like, get rid of it. Make room. We don't need it. I haven't seen this in two years. I don't want it. Get rid of it. I had a. I have a bar of uh, Lux soap. <laughs> from 1960? From, from around then that says, uh, contains hexachlorophene. 
Oh, yeah, that was big in the day. What yeah. Is, what is and you're, I mean, that's illegal now. Yeah. They, they don't... <laughs> Wasn't that Pfizoderm? Because they oh, took that off the market. I don't know Pfizoderm. Or Pfizohex, same thing. But anyway, because I had that, I saved it. I have a <laughs> matchbook from uh, the first restaurant, nice restaurant that Shannon and I ever ate okay, at. Okay, well, that's, see, that's kind of a collector's thing. That's not bad. we got to take a break here. I uh, want to ma- uh, make mention to our listeners on BizTalk Radio. This is last week's show. I want to uh, shout out to Travis, who keeps us on the air every week on BizTalk Radio. Hey, Facebook Live, uh, we're going to be back. Going to take a break a bit longer on BizTalk Radio. Bring on our guest. We'll be talking bugs. Questions, comments are encouraged on Facebook Live. Happy Saturday. I'm Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco. Going to take a break. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Welcome back to the show, uh, Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live. Glad you are tuned in. This is Garden America, in case you were wondering. Yeah, we talk about uh, horticulture, plants, gardening, dirt, fertilizer, all those great things. And today we're going to be talking about uh, bugs as we bring in our guest all the way from across the pond. Tiger? Yeah, this morning we have Vicki Hurd, the author of Rebugging the Planet, joining us. Um, and before we get started, Vicki, I just want to make sure that you can hear us okay. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we have a new uh, phone setup system. Yeah. And then before we got going too far, I wanted to make sure we were all set with that in case we had to make any changes. And we do want to remind our listeners, this is a different phone system than what you're used to every week with our guests. Yeah, so uh, Vicky, you know, joining us from over there in wonderful London, it's 4 p.m. your time. So, you know, good evening, good morning to us. Um, you wrote the book, Rebugging the Planet. And, you know, I got to tell you, yeah, I know you're 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 an entomologist, but like, were people just baffled as far as why you would want more bugs in this planet, kind of a thing? Yes, yeah, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book actually to to get people more aware of how important bugs are in our lives, and there are annoying ones and and lethal ones, but they are a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. The majority of bugs just do us a lot of good without us really knowing. So I was writing the book to help people understand that and see what they can do to help. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, importances, I know that in the book you describe why, you know, and, you know, earlier in the show we were talking about, you know, the whole circle of life and, you know, how the smallest thing can create a huge impact down the road for us all. And I think for the most part, people understand the importance of bugs in our planet and in, in our society and to our life. But at the same time, they just feel like, no, they're overpopulated anyways. It, we, we should be able to control them and have no effect. Now you're starting to study that and see that no, even you know a small population loss can actually create a huge effect on all of us, right? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it, it really makes a difference, and we've made their home so much more difficult to live in. You know, the habitats get more and more fragmented, but it really is hard for them to survive and colonize and move around and um, uh, breed. In, in ways that can really affect our ability to feed ourselves, to have clean water, to have decent soil in which we can grow all the crops for fuel, fiber, and food. Um, so it really matters that we look after them. But the, the data um, in the last few years is that um, there's a real risk of many going out of, um, going extinct even. 41% is the latest study that 41% could be extinct by the end of the decade, which is really frightening because a lot of them are really important for pollination, but there are many more other services that they provide for us. 
So um, I think, un understandably, people are, are nervous of bugs or they think they're dirty. But actually, if we had a, a different attitude, I'm actually asking people to rebug their attitude to bugs. Mm -hmm and think about them in a different way. So maybe they don't have that revulsion. They recognize that they're important and don't automatically reach for the chemicals to eliminate them. Is it safe to say that bugs help keep our planet clean? They do. I mean, we would be more than knee high in, in waste and um, revolting materials if the uh, bugs weren't recycling that waste into something much more useful and nutrients that can be then recycled by fungi and, and make good soil and um, good uh, nutrients for plants to grow in. If the bugs weren't doing that, and even our dead bodies, you know, the dead bodies of us and the animals that um, die in the wild and everything, they're all recycled by bugs. Where would we be without that happening? Um, without those wonderful beetles that, that get get started immediately and the flies that mad yeah. that actually decompose those things. They're really important and also for cleaning water as well. A lot of bugs are doing a lot of water cleaning that we're not even aware of. Yeah, you know, like you say, like, where would we be? I mean, maggots amaze me. I know they they sound disgusting and they're creepy and they're crawly yeah. and, you know, they are always we around. We the new word for maggots, can yeah. we, I think. Yeah, there you yeah, I go. I think it's the word, you're right. Yeah, you know, because, but it yeah. amazes me because they will just come up almost out of nowhere when the yeah, right opportunity exactly. is. Ingenious. Yeah. yeah, you know, it is, it is genius. Um, hey, um, you mentioned, you know, something right now, and you were talking about the environment. When we talked earlier this week, I asked you some of the biggest causes of a decrease in population. Um, and one of the biggest things you said was just the habitat loss of, of these areas. Yeah. And, and it's not so much like we're building homes or businesses or cities and, you know, losing habitat, but there's m way more to habitat loss than just that, right? Absolutely. And in fact, a lot of data is showing that some of our cities um, are actually amazing refuges for the bugs that can no longer live in rural areas um, because they've been, you know, uh, the chemicals, the pesticides, the loss of the hedgerows and trees and messy bits that once were in the countryside and the way in which um, crop, crop rotation happened and you'd have livestock and it'd be messy. That's all become much more uniform and um, monoculture across the rural areas. So bugs, if they can't live there, they're coming in, you know, some of them are managing to survive in our gardens, in our parks, if they're well looked after in those areas and they're actually providing refuge. But we should be doing things for, for habitats in the, in the urban areas as well. There's a lot you can do, even on concrete. You know, you can have planters, you can have um, things growing up walls and on roofs. There's a whole heap of stuff we can do better in urban areas and in your workplace. Um, even in, you know, side of roads, that can be an amazing refuge for, for bees with the wildflowers and worms and all the other critters that we need to, to keep soil going. They all need those corridors that our, um, even our roads and our hedgerows and our cities provide to move around in. And another area that I was surprised when you mentioned it was the waterways. And you mentioned bugs clean water, actually. And for, and for us in Southern California, it's a huge thing because, you know, unlike unlike you in, you know, London, water shortages here, you know, are common. We live in a desert Mediterranean climate. Um, so we always are looking for fresh drinking water to be able to supply ourselves with. Um, and you say there's a lot, there's a large bug population that cleans the rivers and waterways and things like that, right? Yes, they provide a service by filtering out all the bits, even the chemicals, um, but they filter out all the um, detritus and leaf litter that would become disgusting if it built up, but the bugs break it down and allow even smaller bugs like the bacteria and the fungi to actually break it down further so it can then be used by plants in the water or by other animals in the water. So they take that out and filter it. There's one particularly gorgeous one called a rotifer, and it's got this little wheel of hairs on the top of its head like cilia, and they, they take take in the bits of stuff in the water and, and clean it through their system. So basically their stomachs are really good for cleaning. All, all these bugs' stomachs are really good for cleaning our water. And uh, But you have a real problem in California, I, absolutely, with um, access to water and um, uh, droughts, etc., because a huge amount of water is being used in very large monoculture farming systems there. And it's a huge part of your economy. But I think, you know, it's going to have to change if we're going to still have um, water and, you know, um, natural systems that you need for um, those trees, like those almond trees and fruit trees to grow. 
um, and it's incredibly difficult for um, bugs to live in those environments. Yeah. Um, hey, we're going to have to take a break. When we get back from the break, we're going to be continuing our discussion with Vicki Hurd, the author of Rebugging the Planet. And when we get back, Vicki, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's funny, we talk about bugs, but but what do they, they don't, they just bug us. There's really not that big a problem and nothing causes that big of a problem. So when we get back, we'll continue talking with Vicki Hurd author of Rebugging the Planet. Yeah, do stay with us. And again, those on uh, Facebook Live, your questions, your comments regarding the, the bug situation as we try to debug what we're talking about this morning here on Garden America. Do stay with us, of course. Uh, Going to take a break on uh, BizTalk Radio Facebook Live. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. And uh, Vicki, we're talking bugs right here on Garden America. Back here on Garden America, I hope you're having a good weekend uh, so far. Thank you for tuning in, Facebook Live, and those listening to this pre-recorded broadcast on BizTalk Radio. Vicki, the entomologist uh, from uh, Great Britain, England, London, talking bugs this morning and, and the impact that's happening around the world, the Tiger, and uh, the, the lack of bugs and what that does to our environment. Yeah, and, you know, before the break, I'd mentioned, you know, for, for humans, you know, what problems do bugs cause i mean you know here in southern california i mean aside from agriculture problems you know west nile virus and a mosquito um how about I, malaria yeah <laughs> in a you know malaria you know the you know but that's also i think only one bug really right you know yeah. i mean well i, I yeah, think there, I would... are, there are a number of yeah a number of mosquitoes that do transmit diseases and the tsetse fly in africa and there are and cockroaches you know they they can if, if allowed to um, transmit diseases, but at the same time, they all play a really important part in the ecosystem. Um, and we, if we zap them all, you know, with chemicals, yeah. remove all their habitats and everything, then we're potentially zapping the birds that feed on them um, and the um, owls and the mammals. You know, these are really important base of a food chain. So we've spent so long, so many decades learning how to kill insects and yeah. other bugs because we you know seems a problem um we've actually forgotten how to look after the good ones and there's loads of good bugs that can eat the bad bugs as well so you're zapping both and it's not a healthy situation um and lots of bugs are really good at eating other bugs um and yet our chemicals pesticides just get rid of them all so we end up in this cycle of chemical use and um we don't let nature do the work it can do for us. And also, in terms of really nurturing soil, any gardener knows if you've got really good soil, you've got robust plants that can withstand any pest and, and other diseases. Um, so having good soil with good animals in the soil, the worms and the springtails and all sorts of amazing bugs down there, they will help your plants to be rigorous against any attack. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, so it... You know, when you really think about it and you want to kill the ants, kill the cockroaches, mm. you know, they're really not mm. doing anything bad I, I to think you. They're not doing anything bad. Yeah. yeah. If, they, if they are, if they're stinging or they, if there's a risk of yeah. in your garden, I think it's perfectly reasonable to keep them out. But try not to zap them because you're zapping other good things. Try not to. Um, and there are ways of keeping things out. You know, stop the entrance holes into your house. I talk about that in my rebugging book. Loads of really low impact ways of, of stopping the bugs if you really don't want them. Yeah, and I that's think the way to do it. we should be able to all live a little bit in harmony. I mean, I I come every Saturday morning here, Vicky, and I sit next to John. Bagnosco over here, one of probably the biggest bugs around. <laughs> it's you know, pretty, and I can, big. and I don't just spray exactly. him with a pesticide, yeah, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that unlike any other species on Earth, bugs look very alien, yeah. like like they come from another yeah. planet. And and to the common person, they just think they're icky. They don't understand them. They're, they're weird looking. They've got antennas. They got they got you know a thousand legs on whatever. Well, just be glad they're so small. Because, oh yeah, right. Can you imagine what they would look like if they were the size of a dog or a cat? Ab yeah. Absolutely. So like like you mentioned, Vicky, yeah. that that bugs themselves have natural predators that keep you know the ecosystem in balance, and then we pile on with our chemicals and really upset that balance. And and now we're starting to see the, the huge effects. Correct. Absolutely. And, and what scientists are actually 
sending out warning signals now. They've seen huge crashes in numbers and diversity of bugs in many parts of the world, particularly in, in the more affluent world where we've got lots of money to do the research, but also in the um, tropics and other parts. We need more research, but there was a really alarming warning signal coming from those um, uh, research sites and the surveys showing crashes in fly numbers, beetle numbers, all sorts. And we really need to listen to those scientists. And the scientists are actually saying, we need the research, but we also need people to care. So they tell politicians that we want to do things differently. And so politicians can support farmers in doing things differently and help um, consumers purchase things, you know, that really won't hurt the bugs. There's a whole load of things we do when we buy in shops, when we buy things. We can be helping or hindering the bugs to survive. And so there's, there's a whole range of things that can be done to stop this decline. And scientists are saying, we really need to do it all. Yeah. John, John really stands behind the idea of not driving either, because as he's mentioned before, the, when we drive, you hit and kill bugs, you know. And no, I propose in, more <laughs> driving because otherwise we would be knee deep in bugs. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so. Well, actually, in the UK, we find we don't see so many dead bugs on our windscreens anymore. That's what partly has alerted people to this issue. We don't see them on the windscreen. Dead bugs. It's, it's uh, a very real example of where the, the general public is seeing a difference. You know what? And, and we see the same thing here. We were talking about that this morning on the way into the studio. And mm-hmm. when we got here, Vicki, that. Yeah, no bugs on the cars anymore. We don't see anything in our in our the grills of our cars, and and that in itself that that's a huge indication because it used to be all the time. Well, we had a listener exactly. last exactly. week yeah. wondered if it was because cars were more aerodynamic now mm-hmm. that maybe the bugs were uh, able to bounce off. But you would well, still see them on your grill, maybe not your windshield, but your grill is still kind of a flat surface to a degree. Yeah. Possible, I don't know. <laughs> It's possible that they're more aerodynamic, but the yeah, the, the curves are making them fly yeah. off rather than flat. Um, I think in general the the, the data is there. Um, it's very clear across the globe and so, sends so, out alarm signals. So, Vicky, um, you know, you mentioned large declines in populations. And, mm-hmm. you know, unlike a, uh, a panda bear, which, you know, we're studying and, you know, I think they I just heard that they're off of the endangered species list now. You know, we, they've been able to kind of repopulate. I, I don't see them on my windshield either anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, there's a lot of research. It's, it's easy to kind of study them. They, they, you know, can do that. You know. Are bug populations dropping out in large numbers because small effects on their environment change them so dramatically, or is it because you know we're not we're not really seeing the research until it's almost too late? What do you what do you think there? It's a, com- it's a yeah, it's a combination. As you know, as I was saying, a lot of research on on bugs and particularly insects and um, are done on crop pests and pests that you might you might not want in your house or eating your clothes, you know, like moths, and so much research hasn't been done on the good bugs and how we make sure that they survive. So there is a, there is a gap in research, but it's really clear from all the um, tracks and surveys that have been done by scientific institutions around the world that there, there is a problem. And so, you know, it's very, very clear that we do need to rebug everywhere um, yeah. to counter this problem. And, you know, the other thing is that is very easy to see, you know, we could helping a, a wolf come back or the polar bears survive and everybody sees those big cuddly megafauna is really important and I want them to see the bugs, the smaller bugs which can be just as beautiful um, I think they're absolutely stunning and astounding if you look at them up close and now we've all got smartphones we can look at them up close and you can see the extraordinary beauty of these animals um, in the same way that you can see beauty in a, um, a wolf or a bear or a cat wild cat so what do you in, in in the book you list some things, but you know what are some things that you recommend people do to start really thinking about rebugging the planet? Where where do you think people should start on a on an individual level? On an individual level, yeah, I think there's really what I put in the book is sort of things you can do if, if you want to even save time or just spend very little amount of time, and then if you've got more time, do more things you can do in your house. Um, try and reduce the amount of chemicals you're using, and um, keep the bugs out using other means, and I I talk about how in the book. Um, And in your garden, try and leave wildflowers, leave the weeds, and don't think of them as weeds, but think of them as food for the bees and the bugs and the bumblebees that you like to see, and the butterflies that pollinate your plants. So 
you know, maybe don't have huge lawns with just boring grass. Leave some of it for, for um, the wildflowers to grow. So there's a lot of things you can do in the garden, cut the pesticides, you know, there's a whole, whole host of things. Leave some rotting wood for the stag beetles, those kind of things. That's the thing you can do in your home. You can also purchase things differently. And I talk about that a lot in, in Rebugging the Planet, about your food purchasing. It's not only what you buy, you know, eating fresh produce, less processed produce, um, but also where you buy it from. Try and buy it more direct from the farmer. Try and support the farmers doing things differently, that organic and agroecological farmers. Um, and also your clothes. I talk about cotton. It's one of the most destructive crops on the planet. Huge amounts of insecticide are sprayed on cotton crops because it's extremely tasty for the bugs, <laughs> particularly one called cotton, cotton ball worm. So, wow. you know, if you try and not use so much cotton, reuse the cotton, reuse your T-shirt, don't throw it away after one use. I mean, the fast fashion industry is a really bad thing for the bugs. Yeah. Um, so it's what you buy in your food, your clothes, your, your furniture. You know, reuse, recycle is brilliant because you're not taking a big toll on the land. And on the rainforest as well, there's big problems. Our rainforests, our wetland areas, which are incredibly diverse, important for the, for the bugs. So it's what you... But then the third thing I think you can do, if you can get involved in local politics, or even national politics, you know, federal level... Hey, um, hey, Vicky. Campaign. Vicky, real quick, I don't want to cut you off, but we are going to have to take a break real quick, and we'll get back. We'll continue talking about how you can get involved to um, help rebug the planet. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, Vicki, our entomologist, talking about bugs and uh, debugging and what's going on with the environment, uh, not just in this country, but, of course, around the world as it comes to the decline of uh, bugs in the insect world. We're going to take a break. BizTalk Radio, Facebook Live, back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Back from the break here on Garden America. Happy weekend. Hope you had a good week, and uh, we're kicking off your weekend in a very positive way. That is our goal here on Garden America as I toss back to Tiger, and we continue with our conversation, wrap things up with Vicky. Yeah, before the break, um, Vicky was telling us on how to um, get involved with rebugging the planet. Again, author Vicky Hurd of the book Rebugging the Planet. And before the break, Vicky, you were mentioning getting um, your opinions heard You know, on, um, on a more political level. And, you know, this is something that people don't always think about because, you know, politics, it comes to, you know, voting for a person or maybe a law or um, maybe, you know, where money goes. But there's actually, you know, a lot of laws um, and different things in place on a political level that, you know, people don't realize could either be hurting, you know, a, a, a specific, you know, bug or, 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 or a problem or, you know, you know, if you if they change things, it can help it. And. You know, so so kind of knowing those laws and rules is important for people as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, you've had some fantastic people power results. Your um, wild reserves and, and natural parks are um, national parks are absolutely amazing and full of wonderful bugs, and that's because people wanted them. And I think they can do. You know, we can do that again in terms of the laws that are harming the bugs. You have billions of pounds spent by the agrochemical industry lobbying to make sure that your laws in America don't stop sales or reduce sales of agrochemicals. And that lobbying is specifically, you know, for, for the kind of things that really hurt the bugs. And I think if everybody joined together, you can join organizations like um, you know, the Dirt Sea Society, which is for um, invertebrates, but you've got um, Audubon and all those other Sierra Club organizations that will help you campaign for the kind of laws that will help bugs and stop the kind of lobbying that will, um, you know, lead to laws that are harmful. And I think, you know, people power is the thing that we need, really. Uh, it's the only thing that really changes anything, as we know. <laughs> so if people get involved, and you can do it at a local level as well. I think there's a lot of things that come out with your um, local state legislation and protecting local um, areas of wilderness and, and helping people to eat differently, to buy things differently, to support farmers that are doing things differently. Really get involved and just join in. You don't have to do it alone. That's one of the things. I give lots of tips in the book, um, but one of the big tips is you really don't have to do this alone. There's a lot of people who will support you, and you might even find new communities to work with. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about the book. So the the book, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I just know the beginning of the title is Rebugging the Planet. What's the what's the second part of the title, Vicky? Yeah, it's quite long. We, we, <laughs> we struggle with this, but it's the remarkable things that insects 
and other invertebrates do, <laughs> why we need to love them more. I mean, it's, it's long, but it kind of says what it does in the title. We do need to love them more and have a different attitude and do things we can, everything we can to help them, because they're in trouble. And I think the book was just released in the U.S. this last week, right? Mm -hmm. I went to Amazon and saw that it was for the first time available. Yeah. I know it was, I think it came out two years ago in England. Did it Did it come out no, two it's years not ago? Out yet. Oh, no, it's not out yet. It's out um, this week. Oh, oh look at that. Really? We're, we've, yeah. we've got the look preview here. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And you're ahead of the, you're ahead of the yeah, curve. Yeah. Ahead, ahead of the curve. curve and how long And how long have you been working on this book? Well, they had to get the bugs out of it, Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. That's what took <laughs> yeah. so long. Right? Well, one of my aims is, is when you rebugging into Google, you don't get lots of things about IT and debugging your computer. You <laughs> my book. Um, but I've been working on it for a couple of years. Um, COVID, because during the lockdown, I couldn't go on holiday. I, I managed to finish a lot more um, <laughs> during the last year. Yeah, so it was yeah. kind of uh, that, that bug, <laughs> yeah. COVID bug, helped yeah. me finish it. Okay. Vicki, I wonder if you address this in your book. The um, mm -hmm. And it may be off topic for what you're trying to get across, but... Um, with the uh, world becoming smaller and bugs mm. that used to stay in, in, you know, maybe in their places in Australia, uh, you know, now are all over Southern California eating all our eucalyptus trees. Um, what happens when... It, I do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do talk about that. It is an issue. I don't like the way they're called alien or, you know... Um, invasive species. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's invasive species. It's very negative, and it's you know, negative about bugs in general, and I think we should steer away from that. That is a problem. We, you know, we know that's a problem, particularly for crop pests, so we have to take some measures to, to control that. But one of the ways it is happening is because people are bringing these things inadvertently in their food or in um, horticulture plants that right. they bring in. Right. So the way I talk about it in the book is try and buy locally grown plants and locally made food. Don't bring things in in your, in your luggage or on your packages. That's a personal thing, but there's a, a bigger, you know, government action needs to, to, governments need to take action to control that. But at the same time, we also want to recognize climate is changing. We're going to get these bugs. They're going to take um, a while to get into a balance with the other bugs. There'll be other bugs that eat them. They'll eat other bugs. You know, these natural systems will go in a cycle, and they'll probably settle down into a, um, a place where we can be happy with sharing our space with them. But it'll take a while, and some will just have to deal with. Uh, I think the automatic assumption that every invasive species is going to do us harm is, is not always the case. That's very true, and yeah. We, yeah, yeah. So we need to think about that. We're all, we're all migrants, really, aren't we? <laughs> very one true. Planet, this one home. Yeah. We've got to share it. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, you know, lots of great information. Again, the book Rebugging the Planet, author Vicki Hurd. I did post a link on our um, Facebook chat feed to a, um article you wrote about why you wrote the book, which links to your website great. as well. Yes, well, I've got a website. Yeah, I've got a website. With, and I took pictures in my garden as well, which I've got up there. It shows the diversity you can have in a tiny, tiny garden. Yeah. If you do it right. Oh, beautiful. Well, you know, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you know, good evening. Hope you have a – Yeah. I, you're, you're a little bit dry there, you, you said. You're, you're a little bit of a late summer <laughs> still spell. It's still warm, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's nice and warm, actually, at the moment. Uh, we've had rain and, and uh, gorgeous warmth in one day. So ah, pretty weird. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. I hope, I hope everybody can get rebugging. Yeah. Thank you very thank much, you Vicky. Very you much. take care. Bye-bye. Okay. All righty. So, John, um, well, yeah, I, I, I think you know, she wants to change the terms, you know, because they're negative. How about unauthorized relocation? <laughs> you <laughs> know, <laughs> if you look at every population of whatever it is, from people down to bugs, you know, through birds, uh, yeah. fish, there's terrorists in every group. Every group. And the terrorists need to be controlled. You know, if you keep terrorists in the middle east we don't have any worry over here but the problem is when they come over here 
you know, they cause These havoc. Bugs. And the same thing with bugs. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, we're going to take a break. Those on uh, Biz Talk Radio news coming up top of the hour. And then uh, we're back at six minutes after, according to your clock and your logs there on the network, Biz Talk Radio. Hey, for the rest of us on the Facebook Live, it's going to be a quick break. So, hey, questions, comments, you want to talk more about the bug situation or, or take this show in another direction, we are happy to do so. I'm Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox, and, of course, John Bagnasco. Going to take a break. Back after these messages and news on Biz Talk Radio. If you are tuned in on BizTalk Radio, this pre-recorded show from last week, we are opening up our number two, six minutes after. Hey, those on Facebook, we're going to keep on rolling. Hope you got a lot out of that interview with Vicki and her book and the fact that, uh, yeah, we are seeing a decline in bugs, and there are certain things that we can do to help mitigate that. So, good stuff, Tiger. Glad we found her. Yeah, and, you know, just to kind of expand on the topic a little bit on our on our own level, you know, John, you know, being in this um, – uh, nurserymen's industry for so many years has seen a change too, where you know it went from you know blanket pesticides for your garden. Oh yeah, you know where they just used to spray and kill every known bug in the garden. Kill them, kill them all. Yeah. To now, you know, when you go to a nursery, you know you're buying a specific product for a specific bug. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to take care of, uh, you know, you know scale and aphids and mealy bug, you're going to buy neem oil, insecticidal soap. You know pyrethrin, something like that. If you're going to try to kill a grasshopper, worm, chewing insect, you're going to buy spinosad. And, you know, it's just that. And you can't really buy them together. I mean, there's, you know, Natural Guard has a product actually called spinosad soap, which mm -hmm. combines them. And but it, but it, But it doesn't kill spiders. You know, it doesn't kill ants. It doesn't kill, you know, ladybugs. It doesn't kill praying mantis, you know. So they're, they're selective because... In order to kill these bugs, you have to understand the chemical makeup of these bugs. Right. And then develop a process, like you said, of a chemical, well, not a chemical maybe, but but some something that would only kill them and not the good ones. Right. And and that's what the industry has kind of moved to, is trying to be more specific in that way. Um, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe it's just California that we see that a lot. I don't know if the, the rest of the United States, um, you know, feels the same way. Obviously, they have different bug problems, you know. Um, but... Um, you know, you're starting to see that shift where, you know, and then even like ants, you know, um, we, we talk about taro, you know, a great product for ants. They're a pest. I don't want them in my kitchen or in my house right. either. They're annoying. Stay you outside. Know? But there's ways to keep them outside easily without having to blanket spray your garden or your home. I didn't see that many ants this year. We no? didn't. No, not, you, not in you, previous years. You better years. knock on wood right now. You better knock on wood. <laughs> right. They, they were just waiting did. for you to say that. Ex exactly. <laughs> this is the time of year they all come in the house right. looking for water. Yeah, looking for water. Exactly. Yeah, I, I have this weird bug. Um, when I brought the bought the property, they um, just decided to drop that brown um, stained bark over everything, which was just like shredded pallets. And they is that make like it we brown. have outside here what they did here? No, yours is a natural product out there. Oh, okay. I mean, it is, I think, kind of probably shredded wood or right, whatnot right, but, right, right. but anyways with that i don't know if it was with that mulch or because that mulch went in there's a um a little weevil a little beetle that is known to just you know eat that dead dry wood and every year during this time it they hatch and i'm talking millions and millions of them for some reason they go from my backyard and I always see them just making their way to the street in my front yard. I don't know where they're going or where they think they're going to find more dead wood, but they do this every year. It's kind of like a, a, a migration I see, and I'm starting to see that right now. And we were talking about that if there was more traffic on your street <laughs> they to would, run them over. They would there would be less population. Right. But um, but um, you know, I talked to um, you know, pest a pest guy about them, and he goes, "There, there's no effect. You know, like they're not like a termite that are going to get in your home." And he goes, "Just." Let them be. So what are them, they? They're, I, I forget the name did, of it. Did he know? That he, he knew exactly what they okay. were. Okay. And he goes, they don't eat your, you know, they're, they're not going to eat your home. They don't eat plants. They don't carry diseases. He's like, just just let them do their thing, you know? And I'm like, all right, you know, they're just kind of annoying, but 
You know, let them do their thing. Well, they're doing something. I mean, well, I think they're, they're serving just, a purpose. Yeah, they're breaking down that wood and right. whatnot. So. Right. Wow. Yeah. So not every bug needs to get killed. Now, you want to talk about the state of Washington and the uh, the hornets up there, the murder, murder hornets? hornets. Do you got see them, the suits that they wear to handle that stuff? Yeah, and, and they've got them sectioned off in the state of Washington, you know, these various places. And, again, these were probably brought over by somebody by accident. They didn't fly over from where they I don't know. They look like they. it's an eagle, and it could fly across the well, yeah, it could probably pick <laughs> up ocean. a small child. <laughs> but again, the murder hornet was that the media gave him that. Name. Oh yeah, it's a little, yeah. little, little much. Yeah. But there's an example of uh, an insect mm-hmm. that's and and they prey upon the good insects. Yeah. You know the bees and and you know, honeybees and so on and so forth. So that's why they're a problem. Yeah. You know what Tiger was talking about earlier though about how we don't just kill everything now. Uh, you know, back when I first started in the garden center yeah. in 1967 was my first year. Uh, you could buy DDT right off the right. shelf. Oh, yeah. It, uh, but it was used to kill everything. And you could run a plane and drop it. And, <laughs> and, and well, you know, Rachel Carson came out with her book in 62, Silent Spring. And one of the chapters was indiscriminately from the skies. Mm-hmm. Because um, I think that chapter talks about the fire ant invasion. Yep. And how they were moving from Florida uh, west. Yep. And somebody decided, you know, we're going to kill all the fire ants. And they took dieldrin and uh, put it in planes and just sprayed everything. And they had, I mean, there were birds dropping dead out of Gosh, trees right. and and mammals that were dying. I mean, and, and that no wasn't one, that long ago. And no one ever bothered to check to see whether it would kill ants. <laughs> and it turns out it didn't kill ants. Yeah. I mean, we do some of the silliest things. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. You know, just terrible example of bad planning and not not good intention, but just bad well, Okay, so through. if I understand John correctly, and I think I do, <laughs> all they would have had to have done is to go out, collect some fire ants, bring them into a lab, Spray Te- some. Test them with these products. You don't even have to bring them in a the lab. All they have to do is go out and just spray them out and just, did it kill them? But, nope. But I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, either either way. And yeah. and to have uh, done that, it, not that long ago. Right. Yeah. I mean, now, aren't we trying, now, again, this is off the topic a little bit, but when it comes to cancer, okay, so chemotherapy, mm-hmm. it just kills everything in your body, right? The good yeah. cells, the bad cells. Right. Aren't we trying to do the same thing where the chemotherapy can be selective and only kill cancer cells? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how far along we are. Some cancers we're pretty good at, mm-hmm. but there's still some cancers that we just right. haven't figured out a way. Well, one of the things Vicky was talking about was um, good bugs, right? Right, sure. And I guess what we call a good bug is one that kills a bug that we don't like. Yeah. So Or, or does something without bothering us, like an earthworm. You know, it just eats right. until soil, but it doesn't bother us. Technically not a bug, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's not? Oh, I mean the, the earthworm. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. and, and, and a uh, tomato. So anyway, the the point there is that if you have, um, for instance, some of the reasons that we had, what was it here in California about? Was it ten years ago the giant white fly became oh, a problem? Oh, uh-huh. if, twenty years ago. Twenty yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah. And they were everywhere, right? It everywhere. Was just like. Cotton candy. Yes. <laughs> Angel hair over every hibiscus. Every all over the yeah. hibiscus. But yeah. then they brought in an insect that would kill that mm-hmm. or attack that particular Don't see, don't see it anymore. No. Yeah, I mean, occasionally, but it's not a big problem. No. Yeah. And that was smart. That was. Well, natural controls are actually better in the long run than a chemical control. Sure. Because for a chemical tr- control, you're always you're always worried about the bugs developing a resistance yeah. to it. Right. And then there's the secondary kill in a lot of <laughs> situations. But they will develop over time a resistance, you would think. Yeah. yeah. Well, they do but, because they're, the lifespan of an insect is so short. Mm-hmm. You know, where, you know, it's 20 years for a generation in a human. You know, you you might have 20 generations in two or three months of a bug. Mm-hmm. Now, for the giant white fly, what was that beneficial bug? Was that lace wings? Which which beneficial bug for the giant white fly? You said I think it was a parasitic wasp. Oh, was it a parasitic wasp? Right. Yeah. That they they released. Yeah. 
and you could uh, could see where they had been released because the giant whitefly started disappearing in those particular areas. Didn't we talk about a product that would help that, John? What was that earth worm? Wait, was worm castings? Worm casting with white Well, clay? also back then, soil soup, right? So, yeah, exactly. so it was yeah. both, but that and the worm castings and and not using um, not using chemicals, liquid chemicals. Oh yeah, like. Um, water solubles that are going to encourage wheat growth that's going to attract bugs. Um, Rick says that he's uh, in Idaho, said he's finally starting to pick a few tomatoes, and he really likes Thornburn's terracotta. Oh, nice. But he, he says, would you say it's more acid tasting? Hmm. I would say it's more balanced. Yeah. It's not uh, sweet. No. Like a uh, sweet aperitif or... or um, Sweet 100 or Sweet 1000 or Sweet Million. But um, I think it's more of a balanced flavor. We're going to take a break. i got to stay on time here for the Network Biz Talk Radio. And, of course, uh, Facebook Live. Keep those questions, comments coming on Facebook Live. It is Garden America for your weekend. Brian Maine, John Bagnasker, Tiger Palafox. Back after these messages, our great supporters here on Garden America Biz Talk Radio. We have returned from the break on BizTalk Radio and Facebook Live as we keep on rolling the beauty of Facebook Live as uh, we, uh, we take things a little quicker and uh, we, we appreciate our sponsorships on BizTalk Radio as well. But on Facebook Live, quicker breaks here. But thank you for supporting us on BizTalk Radio as we return. And I think, John, you have, did you, uh, somebody have a question on well, We uh, have Facebook? several listeners that are commenting on, uh, uh, on our comment about ants coming in the house looking for water. Right. Mm -hmm. Saying they're just starting, you know, the, they're getting, they have an invasion. And there's several things you can do. Um, one thing you should not do, I don't think, is cinnamon. People say cinnamon oh, gets yeah. rid of ants. It's actually not cinnamon, but cinnamon oil that takes care of ants. So other than smelling good, I don't know if that's really going to help. But there's a couple things. Um, is it uh, Bayer has a home pest control, and mm -hmm. I think Taro has a home pest control. That you spray like the perimeter of the your home. The baseboards and mm -hmm. things like that on the inside. Yep. And because I had a problem, and that took care of it immediately. And then on the outside, if you use something like taro granules around the foundation of the house or taro powder, whenever you see a line of ants going somewhere, I don't care where they're going. It's all, they're just looking for trouble, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're on a mission. Yeah. yeah. So if you sprinkle a little bit on the area that they're walking through, within an hour, they're all gone. Mm -hmm. And they take a lot of that back to their nest. And it's something you have to keep up with, but it keeps them out of the house. Same thing if you, this is a good time of year to check plants, you know, maybe citrus trees yep. and see if you've got yeah. ants crawling up into the tree. And you can go ahead and sprinkle some of that around. I've got this um, citrus tree I'm battling with that. Um, you know, it's it's an orange tree that I've had for a long time, and it gets a lot of mealy bug in there. And so I always have ants going up into it, so I'm always mm -hmm. trying to wash it off and you know, keep them out of there. I'm trying to lace out the tree. I cut back this tree so much to try to thin it out because if you allow the, you know, airflow through the tree and light, you know, usually mealy bug and that isn't as bad and you can right. wash it out. But um, this tree just grows back so quickly. It's been there forever. So I think that every time I cut anything, it's just like, yes, more room to grow. And you the know. citrus psyllids attracted to new growth. Too, yeah. So that's, that's always like a always going to happen when you cut back the growth. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, uh, you know, but as we say, you know, with, with these issues, I mean, with the oranges, I've got a lemon, I've got a lime, um, you know, you can just manage it. it. You don't have to completely get rid of it. You can just manage it and it's still fine. Yeah. But the night, that's what I like about the taro powder is you can sprinkle that actually on the trunk. Oh yeah. And it'll stay there for a while. Unless you wash it off, it'll, it'll last for months. And keep now what about you? What, was, what did you suggest for the inside of the baseboards? There's several home pest controls. Are they, are make, they pet safe? If you have pets, once they a lot of the yeah, products, once, once they're, they're dry. dry. Oh yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's usually um, if you're applying any insecticide, I would keep pets away 
and if tell. you're using sure uh, you know until they're dry yeah because yeah everybody asks that about you know a lot of the you know products and a lot of the products once they're dry they don't they don't transfer to the you know the pet's paws or you know kids feet and hands and you know they're they, you know, it's when they're in liquid form or freshly applied right. that, you know, yeah, they get on the paw or the feet and then, you know, that can go into their mouth and then, you know, you have that problem then they ingested it. Yeah. But once it's dry, they don't really have the ability to ingest it. I know our cats, uh, we have three cats and they, early in the morning, they, they do, do what I call bug, bug patrol. Yeah. And they're in every crack and corner of that looking. house and they're looking and they're grabbing and they're getting rid of. What you is, know the smaller bugs, the the, the like um, spiders or yeah, little spiders and uh, silverfish, okay. all those things. So they keep them under control for the most part. Yeah, but that yeah, bug that's patrol. That's hunting. That's, that's their when they hunting. love it. Early they, in the morning, they like yeah. get out there. And I have a lizard <laughs> that lives on my back porch. Alligator lizard? No, not an alligator lizard. Uh, but he patrols the whole area and he climbs up the pillars, and he'll go up up to the ceiling. Yeah, and he'll like just eat spiders down. and things. Ooh, and how, that's how big a lizard is it? You know what kind it is? That's it's interesting. Just a regular California, but not an, not an alligator <laughs> lizard because they're the most common. I, I see know, them all. But they're up. huge. Yeah. No alligator lizards. Yeah, no, they're different size ones. Different sizes. Young. Yeah, different yeah. sizes. How, how many inches would you say that yours well, is? Like that. I'll bet. I'll bet it's an alligator lizard. Yeah, it's I'll not. Bet. A, it's not an alligator lizard. I wonder what the common alligator lizards, lizards, lizards are. have fat tails. Yeah. Because there's alligator lizards. You're thinking of Komodo there's, dragons. There's John. blue belly. There's there's blue belly lizards, right? Those I'm are not common. thinking of a skink. It's, skink. <laughs> it's not a gecko because he'd be trying to sell you insurance. No. But anyway, this this <laughs> thing, this it it keeps all the bugs off our back porch. Well, that's beautiful. Oh, that's yeah. Awesome. And they do their push-ups, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, they do their push-ups. Now, is this Stay a free service that he's providing or oh, yeah. pay him monthly? No, he eats all the bugs he can eat. Wow. <laughs> That's a good deal. And the fact that you can actually see him. You know what? Take a picture or a little video next time you see him doing his thing. I want to see this. Well, you know, the first time I became aware of him was about six weeks ago when I was sitting out in the, on the patio and this um, cricket dropped right in front of me. So it obviously had come from the ceiling. And I he's looked getting, up there. He's getting the heck out of Dodge, huh? And I looked up there and I saw the lizard, and I thought, "Oh, that lizard just knocked that cricket off." I was, you know, I was going to say to you that cricket was jumping for its life, running away from the lizard, right? Well, I, crickets are big compared to the size of these lizards. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, after that, I started looking, and he's there every single day. Beautiful. Well, he's got a food source. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I've got tons of lizards. I don't have a cat because I don't have a cat. I've got tons of lizards. Tons of lizards, sure. Yeah. Sure. And I, I think I mentioned before I was thinking of maybe experimenting with guinea fowl. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think guinea fowl eat lizards. And I don't want I, – I don't mind if an occasional road runner gets one. Yeah. But I don't want the guinea you don't fowl want to eating encourage. all my lizards, right? Yeah. Because that's – you know, you you will find that will happen. I mean, you know, you have – the the chickens as well and if you had allowed your chickens to roam you would find there would be a big decrease in a lot of bug populations right. in your garden i mean we have know, one chicken we let roam yeah and she's good she doesn't really bother the plants it's too much it's actually he is it oh and it's, that's it's why, the survivor that's why we don't allow him back <laughs> back into the pen with the yeah. others um, but he does a good job of that. Because I found that at the nursery, because we let our chickens roam the nursery, mm -hmm. and I've seen a huge decrease in bugs just right. in They'll the nursery. they eat all the sow bugs and the earwigs yeah. and things like so that. so much. Yeah. It's really noticeable, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's but it is a balance because they don't ever go completely away, meaning, you know, yeah, there's still bugs there and they still eat them, you know, so it's not like they've eliminated them completely. They but, love all that protein. Yeah. You know, Kim in Arizona is uh, asking about putting Tanglefoot around a tree. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a big fan of Tanglefoot because I think eventually the ants just build up a bridge and crawl over themselves. Yeah. But uh, one thing to, um, to watch for if you are using Tanglefoot is never apply it to the trunk of the tree. Mm -hmm. You always put uh, maybe... They say foil, don't they? Well... Like, like a little foil wrap around the... Or duct tape. Or duct tape. Oh, that's and a good one, too. Put some duct tape around and then put the tanglefoot on the duct tape because tanglefoot is harmful to the trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
direct applying to direct the tree. Apply. Yeah. Okay, direct we're going to take a break. Right? We've got a couple of segments uh, still to go on this uh, Saturday morning or maybe Saturday afternoon, depending depending upon where you are. So we're going to take a break. Uh, yes, questions, comments on Facebook Live, whatever you want to talk about, we are here for that. Along with uh, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, I'm Brian Maine. Messages on Biz Talk Radio, back even quicker here on Facebook Live. This is Garden America. couple of more segments to go. And again, this is uh, your weekend, your afternoon, your morning, depending upon where and how you're listening to us here on Garden America. Hey, be sure to go to our YouTube page, Garden America Radio Show. That's YouTube. That is our channel, Garden America Radio Show. And subscribe to our channel and like us as we build up subscribers and uh, viewership on our YouTube page. Again, that is Garden America Radio, Garden America Show, YouTube, subscribe, like, tell your friends, <laughs> share. The videos are all posted right there, along with our Facebook page. And, of course, GardenAmerica.com, our beautiful brand-new website. I think I covered it all. Hey, there was a couple of timely items in our newsletter this week. Very timely. And uh, items that should be planted now in the vegetable garden. One is Romanesco. Yeah. That looks so cool. That picture. Yeah. That is so neat looking. I know. It's it's really bizarre. It reminds me of something like in Super Mario Brothers. (laughs) <laughs> well anyway it, it sometimes it's called it's not really broccoli but sometimes it's called broccoli romanesco but it's kind of looks like a, a cross between cauliflower and broccoli yeah it looks like the back of a turtle shell from super mario brothers <laughs> <laughs> video game reference well anyway it's a great vegetable and now i don't i asked you if the, you sold it at the nursery yeah i don't know and my guess is probably not. So you yeah. probably you probably sell seeds for it, though. Yeah, I think so. So now would be the time to start the seeds, so that when the plants are up, you you know it'll be fall. You can go ahead and put them in the ground. Yeah. And then, um, and there were also links to uh, videos telling you how to grow the Romanesco from seed to harvest. And then there was an article on um, Egyptian walking onions. Yes. So now's the time to order those and plant those. It's a perennial onion, so once you've got it, it's there forever. Well, unless they walk away. <laughs> but well, <boom. laughs> I started out the article that said, uh, like the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman, no, yes. <laughs> the Egyptian walking onions aren't from Egypt, and they don't walk, <laughs> but they are onions. Uh. So... Um, and there's a lot of recipes on the web now for how to use Egyptian walking onions. Interesting. Egyptian walking onion. Have, yeah. you, have you ever seen a recipe and then that made you want to grow and then have that plant? Because oh, that, all the time. Because yeah. yeah. yes. you, you were talking the Romanesco right. and how when you wrote, I asked, I said, have you ever grown it? Have you ever eaten it? And you said no. And I was like, oh, well. You know, but he's like, after the article, after I wrote the article, I got yeah. hungry and want to. <laughs> well, you know, I almost would grow that just because of the way it looks. Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. And if you click on the link or if you go to GardenTube.com, I think it's the first or second video right up there. Um, and you look at the Romanesco that this guy's growing in his backyard. It's a, it's amazing. They're huge plants. And then they've got those uh I don't know what color green would you call that? It's not quite chartreuse, but it's it's, it's very close. bright. It's yeah. very yeah. bright, yeah, yeah, and very odd looking. I, so, John, you you had something in what was the picture you posted in the newsletter this week? Oh, my stenomessen. Yes, <laughs> it's a. I think it's a South African bulb. I'm not. Excuse me, South American bulb. And I was just looking online to see if it was available anywhere and. The only place I could see it had $20 a bulb. Really? And they were really tiny. So I've had this pot for a number of years, but kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Caught my eye. Excuse me. Oh, Patty in San Marcos says after living in San Diego County for 20 plus years, it seems that there's different insects that have a population ex- explosion. She says there's been ground bees and mayflies 
and this year it was gnats on the house plants. So it does happen. There are population explosions. Of gnats on the house plants. Sounds like a book to <laughs> read. Well, you know, I have a fiddle leaf fig growing outdoors, and I've wanted, wanted one my whole life, but uh, it's growing outdoors because my son bought it as a house plant, and they couldn't get rid of the gnats indoors, the fungus gnats. So he threw it outside and was going to just dump it. And I said, I'll plant that in the ground. He goes, it won't grow, it won't grow. Well, you know, now it's full of new leaves and it looks yeah, great. It's growing. Yeah, and it's growing really well. So thanks to fungus gnats, I finally got my <laughs> my fiddle leaf fig. So September, yeah. what, what are we doing at the nursery? What is this Sur- kind of in between? Surviving. Or you just kind of getting by, oh, right? Man. John and I were talking on the way in. And, you know, right now, when you go in a nursery, we do our best to try to... <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> seasonal really going on either. Yeah, and it's just hot, and every... You know, plants look tired, people look tired, and, you know, it's it's just it's just survival mode right now. But, um, you know, right around the corner, you know, we're going to hit October, which, you know, not in the beginning of October does it start, but towards the end of October, we get our fall kind of stuff, and... You know, I've already seen John's favorite plant hit all of the uh, box stores, you know, the little mums, um, <laughs> you know, already. And they're just melting in the heat there. You know, um, if, if you're in Southern California, please don't buy garden mums. Yeah, gosh. Not right now. They're, it's just, just not the time for them. They're just going to burn up. We've yeah. got hot weather coming. Isn't that terrible how they do that, though? Yeah. These stores. Yes. And, well, you and, know how they are. Well, today, <laughs> you, you know, the unsuspecting public. Yeah. Hey, we um, have uh, somebody s- says they're curious, and they want to know what the benefits of mosquitoes are. Oh, yeah. Carla says to teach patients. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But we went over some of this with Vicki Hurd, our, yeah. our guest, and um, the mosquito larvae are a great source of food, food. for many fish, yep. right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And fish and populations would go way down if there weren't mosquito larvae. And bats and birds for the actual mosquito right. is is mm-hmm. a big portion. For the adult mosquitoes, right. Yeah. Uh, back in the Midwest, purple martins. Yep. Uh, people put up purple martin houses, which you, you may have seen, Brian, that be like a, it looks like a... Uh, bird condominium <laughs> really it'll be a, they're more community well it's uh, a bird yes it's a big house uh imagine a see maybe two foot by two foot or three foot maybe not quite three foot uh-huh. but about two foot by two foot and um and you know the the hole for the bird house this one will have maybe a dozen okay and purple martins will go in there and people try to attract them just mm-hmm. like we do with bats yeah, or sure, owls sure. or yeah. Um, yeah. to eat the mosquitoes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it is hard to think of why they're, you know, they are important. You're right. You know, what do they do? But, you know, they are important food source for other things. And then, as you mentioned, you know, in the interview, we talked about how it's like, okay, well, they're important for these birds or bats or fish. Well, you know, now those fish or birds or bats are important because of something right. else and you know something and then something else, else, something and, else and then that's right. all it is and it you know i it would be hard to find something in nature that isn't important to a whole right exactly you know yeah. in nature there's always a reason one purpose leads to another purpose yeah and yeah. you know it's it's crazy to think and you know john mentioned this earlier too that you know you can eliminate one thing in this giant list of items and it could completely decimate something. And, you know, the biggest thing was the pollinator. Po- right. Pollinator, bug, bird, whatever it is, um, if you eliminate that pollinator, you eliminate that species of plant. And if you eliminate that species of plant, now you've eliminated X, Y, Z down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because, I mean, I mean, just think about it. You know, make it in simple terms. We talk about the monarch butterfly all the time. If you eliminated Asclepius, you would eliminate the monarch butterfly. You know, and then if you eliminate the monarch butterfly, you would eliminate these whole other bird species, you know, and then again, just down the road. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with Asclepius, because I think that's one of the biggest problems that the monarch had in population was, you know, we we kind of shrunk down where they would migrate to in so many ways. You know, Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I remember when I lived in San Luis Obispo up there, um, they they, um, 
Elfin Forest up in up in Morro Bay area. I know there's an Elfin Forest, I think, down here in right. San Alejo, but they had one up there, I think, in Morro Bay area, and they would talk about how these monarchs would migrate, and you'd have you know just hundreds of thousands of monarch butterflies coming in this area. Well, as Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo and those areas started developing, and yeah, more people. that forest got smaller. Yeah. Well, now the migration got smaller, and you know there's less of them. So well, you know, Vicky talked about. Um maybe replacing parts of your lawn yeah. with uh, wildflowers. With wildflowers. And I was thinking when you and I were in England last time, all the meadows we saw. Yeah. Even when we when we went to Sissinghurst. Yeah. You know, there they had a large meadow out there and the meadows were just full of all kinds of wildflowers, but you know, they would attract different types of beneficial insects. We're gonna take a break. We have one more segment coming up here, BizTalk Radio and of course Facebook Live. So Any questions, comments, Uh, one more segment to go, and then we'll say goodbye for this weekend. But again, quick break on Facebook Live, a bit longer, with our uh, advertisers and supporters on BizTalk Radio. Garden America, back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. We are back, and this is our final segment. Hope you're having a good weekend. And you have a, uh, well, hope things are progressed the way you want them to, even after this show. We brighten up your weekend, hopefully, but hopefully other things will brighten up your weekend as well after we say goodbye for this weekend. We've been talking about bugs, insects. We've been talking about the whole balance thing. And did you want to go back to a mosquito cockroach question, John? Or uh... Well, no, that was Tanya that had asked about the mosquitoes. She also threw in cockroaches, and I don't know, you know, the very name. <laughs> cockroaches it's not something that you think can do any anyone any good uh, you know they say there are two things that will be alive after the you know, armageddon yeah cockroaches. cockroaches and keith richards <laughs> uh, i was going to say politicians <laughs> but i repeat <laughs> myself <laughs> hey um you know cockroaches the same thing there's there's uh they're eaten by oh. by certain things you i think you used to grow or you have uh lizards did they eat cockroaches or no crickets small, and, small ones small ones? mostly crickets well, i saw a huge cockroach in the bathroom here this week you know and uh, i was washing my hands at the sink and i felt this Came tap up. tap on <laughs> my shoulder, shoulder and i turned around <laughs> it was a cockroach and he says hey you know we've got ants <laughs> John's said, not I'll get laughing. right on that. I don't even get it. <laughs> John's not laughing. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I, I think there's very few um, there's very few things in this world that are pure evil. <laughs> and you're going to categorize cockroaches as one of those? No, oh. no, no, no. I, they they all have serve a purpose. And I don't know about gophers, but and cockroaches don't do any harm to us. No, you know, they like don't. like at least. You know, ants, you know, they're they're annoying and stuff like that. Cockroaches, I mean, I guess they can get into the You know what they do when and, you turn the light on yeah, and they start fun. and they scurry. Yeah. And they frighten frighten you. It's you know what's funny though is when you go to other places that you really can't fight the bugs. And we talked about Florida and right. you know, Costa Rica or, you know, oh parts of the south and different, you know, other countries. Exactly what you said happens. When you walk into a room, you turn on a light. And all of a sudden, you see just things scurry, and you just kind of you just kind of live with them because there's you can't fight them, like you can't get them out, no. like in in those jungleous areas. You just don't want a, an insect crawling into your ear at night when you're sleeping. <laughs> Earwigs. That's that, what they do. I think that is just horrible. They crawl in your ear, like they lay their eggs in your brain. <laughs> and when they hatch, look they at, eat look out how your evil brains. he looks when he's saying yeah, that. <laughs> he's got his. Hand under his chin. Yeah. He's telling you that story. I, you know what though? You know we you you mentioned cockroaches. You mentioned the name, and Vicky mentioned uh, something earlier, and she's like, "I think we need to reevaluate the names because the names of bugs yeah, is what exactly. strikes that fear, that kind of, you know, just negative uh, feelings towards it as well." So. You know, maybe that's uh, rebugging the world book two. Renaming Rename the bugs. Is, is going to be renaming the bugs. Well, and unless we all learn the, the, the scientific name or the Latin name for all these bugs. I don't think that's going to make them sound any better. There's a lot what, of plants. Do you, do you know any pl- scientific names for, for bugs? There's a lot of plants that are beautiful have, plants. Have an example. And they have terrible Latin names. <laughs> I don't know. Cockroach. <laughs> I mean... 
I, I, I told you guys I'm reading The Orchid Thief, and right. those orchids do not have pretty names. They're really weird names for different orchids. And, you know, if you were to see that, you would never think that's a beautiful flower if you were just look at the name. I have to bring you I – th- I, I don't know if you want to read another orchid book, but I think you would like Orchid Fever. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm reading – I'm almost done with The Orchid Thief, and then I've got, what was the other book that I bought at the same time by um, The World is My Garden or something? Oh, what was it? Uh, by David was... Fairchild? Yes. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah I got did... that one, too. Oh, it is and... The World is My Garden. Yes. And Definitely you said, need to read that. You said that one is yeah. going to be a lot better than Orchid oh, Thief. yeah. After Orchid Thief, I will do Orchid Fever. Yeah. Now, did The Orchid Thief ever get caught? Is that yes. the end of the yes. book? Yes, he did get caught. I mean, the whole book is about him. He He's caught in the beginning of the book. Right, right. And then the whole book is about his, kind of how he got to the end. Then. He's writing these tales from prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, um, but, yeah, orchids, yeah, definitely have a lot of terrible names for beautiful I, plants. I like orchids. That, that's, um, I'm afraid, though, once you yeah, commit. That's the book. You don't it's, stop it's the book. buying them, yeah, propagating that, them. Yeah, this guy was addicted, right, to, yep. to and, searching for orchids. And especially then the more the, you search, the more you find yeah. more and more different species. Yeah. I think the, the main uh, uh, goal in the book, the, um, the Holy Grail, was the ghost orchid, ghost orchid. right? yep. And yeah. he eventually got one, right? Oh, no, he got plenty of them. That's yeah. why he got in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just blown away because I don't know if if you know this, Brian, but um, back in, back in you know, the day, you know, as far as like maybe I think when it was. When you were a kid, Brian. You know, maybe like the, uh, you know, 1700s and, and stuff where they would go and they would just have people that would go into these jungles. Send them out. And just take every orchid off of a tree wherever it may be to bring him back to collectors and things like that um and none of them would ever like really survive and they so to them they were just cut flowers you know not until they introduced a greenhouse right could they ever keep them alive and then even then like they were so competitive that they would then go and like burn out other parts of the jungle so people couldn't have that later on so once they once they harvested what they could they right. would then kill all the rest of them so somebody couldn't come in after it and get more. I'm like, that was like ice cream. <laughs> like ice cream? Yeah. What? The chef that invented ice cream mm-hmm. uh, served it to to the king or to the duke or whoever whoever was the lord at that time, and it was so phenomenal that the king didn't want anyone else to have it, so he killed the cook that invented what? it. Whoa. <laughs> is this in a book form anywhere? I mean, can I read about this? Or? Well, yeah. It's a great ice cream, story. Just ice cream it. thief. Ice cream thief. So then somebody else then, he did kill the cook, right? I think so, because he didn't want him sharing it with anyone but else. But then somehow somebody got a hold of the recipe at some point in time in history. Or and just created it we again. We have ice cream. And on that note, we have to say goodbye. Oh, oh man. man. It's such a lovely show. Hey, well thank done. you for tuning in. Thank Let you me for... also say that may not be true, but Google it. <laughs> <story. laughs> hey, thank you for allowing us to bug you today during our show. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Vicki, who we had on from England, talking about bugs and the decline of the population. Have yourself a good rest of your weekend. Enjoy. We'll do it again next week. Have a safe weekend. We're back again next week here, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock Pacific time, 11 o'clock Eastern time zone. For the entire crew, I'm Brian Maine, John Bagnasker, Tiger Palafox. We'll see you next time, next week here on Garden America. Take care.